Hi, everybody. Thank you for showing up for the, for the movie segment. It didn't take us long. It took us about five or ten minutes after the first session ended in that deep prayer, and then we had our immediate movie given. Uh, Peter heard it and was like, oh, that's the perfect movie. Couldn't have, with all the themes we've been through today and, um, and joining at the end, it, it feels like, you know, it just was, it's just a gift for us to all move through this together. So, this movie that we're going to watch together is is got a lot of the symbols that I used this morning about, you know, finding a way to come off the screen of the world back into the mind and start to, you might say, have a conversation with spirit in the theater about a new way to look at the world and about a way of letting go of the the beliefs and the feelings and the thoughts that made this world. You know, all the dark attack thoughts that have generated this world of time and space, we have to find a way to come back into our mind to look at it anew. And it, oftentimes it does involve questioning, beginning to start to question what is it that I believe and if I'm perceiving a dark, a fearful world, if I have terror in my life, if I have anger, if I have hatred, if I have things that are playing out in the scenes of my earth life, uh, so-called earth life, then what, what's going on in my mind that that would be the projection of, of this darkness. So today's movie is going to be a movie uh, in which the main character uh, has got issues with his father. And if we look at The Course in Miracles, Jesus talks about the ego as the father of illusions. So it's the father of this dark voice in our mind. You know that critical voice, that voice is saying you're not good enough, you never amount to anything, you're not going to be able to make it. It's that dark voice that says you aren't going to be able to forgive. You know, maybe it works for other people, but it doesn't work for you. That dark, like, foreboding voice that, that is always critical and negative and guilt-inducing. And the main character in the movie um, is faced with lots of self-doubt because of the story that he's, he's kind of heard about um, his father leaving his mother. So he's got this abandonment story that's going on in his mind, and we could say that the sleeping son of God that's forgotten the father in heaven ha has this abandonment issue going. Um, and it's quite frequent for the mind when it's asleep and when when it's in this lost in this far country and it's very dark and it's very closed system, it's, it's quite common for the, the mind to project its anger onto God or onto Jesus or onto to the Holy Spirit because this happens because there's a sense of, of deep hurt and deep uh, abandonment. And there can be feelings of neglect, um, I've even listened to songs over the years, you know, and one of the songs is the Young Bloods. It's got that beautiful verse, come on people now, smile on your brothers. Everybody get together, try to love one another right now. But before it gets into that beautiful chorus, there's a line that says, when the one that left us here returns for us at last, you know, it's still got connotations of like, wow, God, God left us in this dark world, and there's there's underpinnings of of anger that go back projected towards God for abandonment, for the fall from grace, um, and so we need a, a teaching like a Course in Miracles to totally reinterpret everything. Even in A Course in Miracles in the text, it reinterprets the fall from grace. 
uh, you know, a lot of us grew up hearing about Adam and Eve and, and uh, God saying to Adam and Eve, you know, uh, enjoy paradise, but one thing. I'm just going to tell you one thing I don't want you to do. Now, how many parents tell their children not to do something, you know, and then they do it? Uh, because just the, this rebellion, but it's like, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a great uh, metaphor for duality. Like, okay, there's paradise, but symbolically don't take a bite out of the, tr the fruit from that tree, because if you bite into duality, if you believe in two-ness, you're going to lose the oneness. Well, it's a nice symbol, but in A Course in Miracles, Jesus said, God could never put his beloved in such a position. So God had nothing to do with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Guess who made that up? The ego, as well as everything else, as well as all of time and space, as well as the flesh, as well as Adam and Eve, everything, the ego made it up. And God, well, what do we say about God? But just pure love, unending eternal love, and so even the belief in the fall from grace, a lot of times people have a lot of anger at God uh, for how could God let this happen, or uh, how, could I, uh, how could I return home? And some people have even said to me, if I ever wake up from this damn dream, who's to say I won't fall from grace again? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I, if, you, if you heard the stuff that I've heard over the years of traveling around the world, but the Holy Spirit is the correction, and the Holy Spirit is like your divine insurance policy. <laughs> if you listen to the Holy Spirit, you actually have the correction that the separation never happened, and of course, you won't fall again because you never fell in the first place. You know, that's the answer. <laughs> you, you have to start to realize that there's a lot of projections that go on to God and the Holy Spirit. But basically, God doesn't know of anything except love and perfection, and, and God doesn't know of time and space. The Holy Spirit was, was an eternal creation that, that is able to seemingly look upon the air and know that it's not real, which makes for a perfect bridge back to heaven. But, but even that aspect of the Holy Spirit that seems to look on the air, guess what? That's an illusion. <laughs> and that part of the Holy Spirit that takes a voice, because when, you need, when you're lost, you need a voice to guide you back. In heaven, there are no voices. It's just pure love. It's just pure nirvana, bliss, oneness. So this movie is good because it gets at at some deep issues around abandonment, it gets at it gets at issues around sickness, around symptoms. It gets at, at issues of which voice are you believing is real uh, and listening to inside of of your mind. It's got a lot of father son themes, which um, yeah, I know Frank when you were sharing about about your lifetime this time. I know when I first met you, Frank, it, it was one of the things we talked about a lot was um, was the hurt and the pain that you felt around your son's suicide um, of a heroin over overdose and then your own struggles with, with heroin. And, you know, it was, I, I remember when you and I talked, it was like this thing like, gosh, you know, if I, if I'd only been there or I was in Europe and he was in, California and, and whatever the, the situation was, you know, it's this sense of regret. Uh, recently, I was talking to Bob Rosenthal and, um, and I had lunch with him and his wife, Emmanuel, but Bob's coming out with, with a new book uh, from, from Loving One to One Love and actually Bob, who's been a, a psych, psychologist, psychiatrist, therapist for many years, he talked to me about how people, when they reach toward the end of their earth life, um, they, they really aren't concerned about the, a lot of things in the world, about, about their wealth or their money or all these other things. The, the real regrets, the things that, or I could say the things that come up in their mind that really bug them 
are relationship issues, like of, of somebody who was very dear to you in your life, but you have had a strained relationship, or you weren't there when you believed they needed you the most, or there's, those are the core sticky points. When people seem to do even a life review, they start to think back to like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I'm not right with my son, I'm not right with my daughter, I'm not right with, with, with my ex-wife or my wife. There's something that is so heavy because there's a sense that somehow there was this connection and this love and somehow it got broken or, or dist distorted or something in some strange way. And that's, that's like a regret, it's like a, a, a very deep regret that comes into the mind. And I think this movie in, in particular is really good for healing that. Uh, it's just a masterpiece of a movie and, and actually um, I know a bit of the backstory with even, it took miracles after miracles to even get this movie made because the script wasn't getting picked up by uh, any Hollywood studios. There wasn't any money to make the movie and then uh, eventually, um, the, the man who plays the, the son in this movie, I think he's also very instrumental in getting the whole movie made, he, he met Kirk Douglas, and Kirk Douglas agreed to do the movie, and then miracle after miracle happened, and this movie miraculously got made. And then, of course, we were just talking in the studio here, I said, I think Kirk is still going, and we had to look it up, and he's 102 years old, and uh, the ego has not been able to kill him off. He, he is still sparkling and shining at 102, and he's kind of like in the Truman Show, you know, to the ego. Is that the best you can do? He's just going strong. So this movie was made years ago. Kirk looks old in this movie, but Kirk is still going. He's like, the ego's trying to pull the death wish thing on him, and he's like, no, thank you. And then we figured out how many years he's been married for 64, 60, 60, 65 years. <laughs> So as far as death and divorce, uh, Kirk, is, Kirk Douglas is in his movie. He's a great, good, strong symbol for uh, do not cave into the ego uh, with its ideas of divorce, guilt, separation, abandonment, and death, ultimately. Um, Kirk is, is a perfect uh, poster child for, <laughs> for this movie. Oh, Kirk, if you were here, I'd give you the biggest hug. He's just amazing. So, but the movie itself is, is spectacular, so I think you're all going to enjoy it. And we may pause at certain points. Um, it's just a great movie. It's just a miraculous movie, and it's so healing, and it so fits in with uh, everything. And I think because I was using the, the theater analogy so much, Peter said, oh, I got the perfect... <laughs> he jumped on that one. So if you guys are all ready to get your popcorn out, and Eric just wrote to me, Eric Nowakowski, saying the popcorn metaphor, are you ready to pop? Are you ready to pop from guilt? Are you ready to pop from abandonment? You know, from, from beliefs of neglect, from beliefs of death. If you're ready to pop into the holy instant, then I think this movie is going to be good. So get the popcorn ready, Jesus is with us, and we are going to get a chance in this movie to come off the screen a little bit and re-examine the world that we've been watching and see maybe, just maybe, if we can give it another purpose. It's like a hypothetical life review of what it would have been like to know about his son that he never got to know, that he left behind because of his busy career and all the things that he had going. But as we were talking earlier about the emotions, it's like all the emotions coming up. You see how he's, he's watching a movie, but how he's talking to the picture, he's talking to the screen, uh, he's, he's commenting, he's judging, he 
is wondering why certain things are happening, he's asking questions and so on and so forth, kind of filling in the blanks, but this is very similar to the dynamic of I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. That if you look at the world as you see it now and the, and the life as it's playing out in time and space, this is a projection of beliefs. And it can seem to the ego arrogant to think that that it's possible to project out a world so big with so many characters, including the character that seems to be your own body. But Jesus assures us in the workbook that that is how powerful our mind. In fact, he goes so far in the workbook to say what happens is what I desire and what I do not want to happen is what does not occur, you know. It's the mind is perceiving everything exactly as a motion picture of the mostly unconscious belief system. And, and then we react and respond to the, what seems to be our daily life as if it's happening to us as a dream character. And it's difficult. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult ride. But in A Course in Miracles, Jesus talks about the self-concepts. He says that the self-concept, this make-believe self, fictitious self, has two tiers. There's the top tier he calls the face of innocence, which seems to be your personality self and the you that you seem to be in this world. And then, then the second bottom tier, he says, is so dark, it's draped with sin, he says, and it's called the dream that you dream in secret. So it's as if the mind forgets heaven, forgets eternity, seems to come to this world, makes up a two-tier self-concept, an unconscious mind, which is where all the desires and beliefs and thoughts of the ego, very dark, full of attack thoughts, uh, that's the dream you dream in secret. And then there's the part that he says that you gave away, which seems to be the world that you came to from somewhere. And you are this person that now has to survive in time and space. And that's only the surface of this entire scheme. And so whatever you perceive happening on the surface is just a projection of what lies beneath. That's why when we were talking earlier, when I was talking to Sylvia and I was describing, you know, Sylvia, your issues with your neighbor and this, you want it done, you want it healed, you want, you want to come back to God in alignment, but it's like this gnat that won't go away. This temptation to blame her is so strong, it's nagging. It's a nagging thing. The reason why it, it, it seems like you, you forcefully, determinedly try to dismiss it and it still is nagging at you is because anything that's in the unconscious mind is basically like running the whole show. It's, it's, it's projecting out the whole world. And it's just convinced you that you're just one of the characters, not all of them. <laughs> Not everything. You're just the Sylvia character. And then this neighbor's not being very neighborly. She's not behaving. She needs to be taught a lesson. <laughs> she needs somebody to really sit her down and tell her, come on, shape up, you know. This is not the way you're supposed to be and act to me. But, but the ego is not letting you in on the unconscious mind. That, that's the dream, Jesus says, the dream that you dream in secret. It's pushed out of awareness, it's, it's stuffed down. And then, sometimes when we just stuff it, and we never even talk to people about it, when we just, we repress it, we repress it, that's how the unconscious mind is kept going. It just gets these irritating thoughts that sometimes pop onto the surface and they get stuffed down and repressed down. And then, it doesn't go away, it just seems to go on and on and on one scene after the next, after the next. 
So in this movie, Kirk Douglas, his character, he was this movie, big time movie maker who's had this big career, who had a child with this woman, but he has not acknowledged the child. He had no interest in the child, and when she came to ask for some money, maybe uh, to for child support or even to uh, because she knew he was wealthy, um, he basically wouldn't even hug her, wouldn't even meet her. He had to keep she had to keep her distance. Get off of my grass, get off of my lawn. You know the distancing, and now he's getting a whole life review with Stan, which is really the life of his uh, son. He, he says on the surface, I, I would never have talked to him that way. That's, I would never have said that. I would have encouraged him and so forth. And Stan just said, well, uh, you know, you never, you never met him. He never met you. This is just a voice in his mind because Stan is saying, you know, to him, you know, you're basically a good guy, but, but this, is a, this is a child that you never met. And it's very much like it goes in this world. When we seem to be living in private worlds with private thoughts, we don't really see the big picture. We don't see the full picture. We haven't forgiven and accepted everything back into our own mind. We're still following the projections of the ego, acting and reacting as if our brothers and sisters are someone not ourself as if they really are other than who we are. It's been forgotten that we're the mind that has made this whole thing up and we have to take the stranger in and include, withdraw all the projections and bring them back to our own mind, like Francis was talking about on the first day. It all has to come back to the mind. There is no escape until we can start to fully take responsibility for our state of mind without blaming, projecting, putting the, the cause out there into the, into the motion picture, into the screen. So let me check with my tech support. They're giving me thumbs up. The movie is back up in Camus. So that was my little spiel for all of us while, while, we're, while we're waiting for the movie to go back up. Okay. Let's take it away. <laughs> okay. All right. We interrupt this movie within a movie within a movie <laughs> to bring you a message from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if I may go back and remind you at the very beginning, you know, when our when our main character, Christopher D or Kirk Douglas character, is being interviewed by the reporter. And um, at, at some point, they, they talk about Romeo and Juliet and different things. And the reporter says to him, um, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that in your movies? Um, when you make a movie that's a tragedy, um, how, do you, how do you end the movie? And do you remember what uh, our Kirk Douglas, the old man, replied to that? You let it end. This world is a tragedy and, and the ego basically is saying you just got to survive and make it through from scene to scene and make it to the point and then for the ego you let it end. You just, you just die at the end. You just struggle through what seems to be the trials and tribulations of this world a tragedy, as Shakespeare might say, and then you just let it end. You just, you just die. Now, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in our mind and are going like, are you serious? Is, is that what you think this is all about? Just struggle and survive as a person and then let it end and die in the end? Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in our minds to help us reinterpret the dream. Because if you don't change the purpose in your mind for this world, if you don't basically 
discover what this weekend's theme is, purpose is the only choice. If you don't actually, with passion and with gusto and with desire, go for enlightenment, go for atonement, go for forgiveness, go for awakening. If you don't go in your mind and go for that with everything you've got, then there's only one other option and that's the ego. And that's just death. The, the same past patterns just repeat over and over. If any of you believe in reincarnation, what do you think reincarnation is? It's just repeating the same mistakes in your mind over and over and over. Or in Course in Miracles terms, that's just choosing the wrong mind. That's like choosing the devil. That's just like choosing to, to stay asleep, choosing to repeat the past, choosing to hold on to grievances instead of forgive, choosing to hold on to attack thoughts in the mind instead of releasing attack thoughts. So, you've, you've got this great help that's come along, and we'll just use the Course in Miracles as a metaphor for a minute, because Jesus not only gives his, his preface, his, his introductions, he gives his 31 chapters, follows it up with a, a 365 day mind training program, and then a manual for teachers and a clarification of terms on top of that. And he's basically saying, you don't even have to believe the workbook, you may actively resist the workbook, you may fight against the workbook, it doesn't matter, just do it. Because that's the mind training, that's what's required to go back to the light, to release the darkness, to allow it up and out. And then he gives you 365 lessons and it doesn't take him long, starts off with nothing I see means anything, number two, I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. But by the time you get to lesson 23, he spills the beans, he, he basically offers you the escape hatch from this tragedy, tragic world, make-believe dream world, but already by lesson 23 he's offered you the escape hatch. He even uses the word escape. He comes right out and tells you it's the escape hatch. Uh, in only lesson number 23 out of 365, he tells you, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. There it is. You know, judge not lest you be judged. Now he's, he's, he's given you a mind training program and he's showing the, the keys to escape the prison already in lesson 23. And he's just going to come back with that escape hatch over and over and over until you say yes to it, until you go for it. So now in this movie, remember that will come back at the end of this movie because at the beginning the reporter says, what do you do with a tragedy in your movies? How, how do you deal with a tragedy? How do you handle a, a drama, a tragedy? And he says, yeah, you just let it end. He's just watching it play out and there's no attempt to heal his feelings for his long lost son that he's never really got to know. He asked his, his nurse, assistant, um, do, you have, do you have children? Uh, is the father still around? All these things, you know, he, he brings it up, he asks it because he still has some deep feelings, he has hurts and wounds that still have not been allowed up to the surface, that still have not been brought up for healing. And his answer is, you just let it end. Which is basically saying, hmm, it's a tragedy, but what else, what can you do? You know, it's basically his way of saying, well, yes, it's a tragedy, and in the end you just succumb. You just give in to the tragedy. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our mind going, what? Succumb to a death wish? You succumb to a life of pain and suffering and misery? You, you're going to succumb to a tragic experience called time and space when you, your Creator loves you so dearly 
Like the prodigal son story, the Creator will come rushing to meet you if you show the slightest bit of interest <laughs> in waking up. What was that <coughs> thing you said again? Overwhelming appeal. overwhelming appeal. Francis is right here reminding me of that overwhelming appeal. God loves us so much that there's this overwhelming appeal for, for you to accept your function, for you to say, yes, okay, I'll help in the wake up. I'll answer the call. The call's going on. You know, we have even strange teachings. I remember in the Bible, uh, when I used to ask about, what's this thing about the Jewish people being the chosen ones? Why are the, why are the Jewish people the chosen ones? And uh, Jesus reinterprets that. He even heals that one. He says, all are called, but few choose to listen. You see how that's a flipping of the chosen ones around? All are called. Every one of us is called, but few choose to listen. Few choose to say yes to the call. It's the greatest call there is. It's the call that will lead you to eternal happiness, but to the extent that you say, mm, just uh, let, let it end. Let this movie end. Uh, I'll just take my chances with the next one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> A death wish who just repeats the same tragedies over and over, lifetime after lifetime. And how do these so-called lifetimes always end? Death. Well, that's a real nice, uh, happy ending. Struggle, struggle, survive, survive, and die. And then do it again. Struggle, struggle, survive, survive, die. Ah! I think maybe we're, we're destined for something more than that. You know, I think actually there's got to be a wake-up call uh, somewhere where we just go, I think ego, you know, I've been mind wandering and tolerant of uh, your death wish for quite a while and you know, I've been playing by your rules and pretending that I'm your servant and uh, giving my body and my world over to you ego so you can glorify yourself and then die. And then I die over and over and over. What do you get from a death wish? Death. Over and over and over. How do you paint, how do you how do you make that drama happy? You don't. Jesus says in the Course, would you paint rosy lips on a skeleton? Well, he's, he's really like saying, would you dress it up? I know I'm in Mexico and it's the Day of the Dead and all this stuff, and, but I am a happy guy. I'm a happy, a happy spirit, so I enjoy the makeup. I like to see the cute faces and the stitches and, and all the things they put on there and the white faces and everything. And I see the call for love underneath it as I see that they, they want to feel this love and connection even with those in their heritage that have passed on. They don't want to even push away the death. You're not going to find people dressing up like in Halloween, but, but I mean, like, they don't do quite quite the makeup. They really do the makeup well down here. I really like the Mexicans because they're, there's a love underneath it. They, they want to remember the love. It's their way of, of trying to connect with and remember the dearly beloved and the dearly departed and those that have gone, gone on. So in this movie, this whole movie is Stan, our Holy Spirit character, kind of showing up in in the main characters, in, in Kirk Douglas's character's dreams, and he's giving him this life review, and in a movie theater, he even lets him drink coffee and smoke cigarettes. <laughs> he, bends, he bends things around. He's using the symbols to make the connection, to make him feel at home and comfortable and relaxed, but in the end, he's, he's giving him a chance to change his perception of, oh, it's just a tragedy and you just let it end, to reach out. You've got to be truly helpful. You've got to let that love that you have in your heart, you've got to let it out. You've got to, you've got to allow the love to come through you to be used in, your, in this forgiveness plan. The person that you think has harmed you, the person that you have the grievance against, the, the one, it could even be yourself. Maybe you have a self-hatred and a self-doubt. Oh, I never reached my potential. I, I could never do this. I could never do that. 
I'm less than, I'm, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy of love. All these crazy, crazy ego beliefs, you know, in the end, you do have to forgive them, you do have to release them, because it's not who you really are, it's not who you've ever been. It's just, it's a make-believe, fictitious movie or dream that seems to be very convincing while you're dreaming it until you actually can come all the way back and see that it's a dream, that it's not, it's not a reality. I, I have people tell me sometimes, David, get, get your head out of the clouds, get real, it's terrible. And I'm like, no, I don't think that's real. Why don't we really be real? Why don't we be Christ real? <laughs> Why don't we be eternal love real? That's what I'm talking about. Not this mesmerism of uh, projection of images, which goes by the name of reality. It's, it's definitely, this world is a faulty formulation of reality. That's what Jesus calls it. It doesn't even resemble eternity, this world of time and space. Not even close to eternity. So let's see what happens here. Now, you see, He's with Stan, and, and now um, his son, who, who he thought was taking another Darth, dark turn into Goth, <laughs> which he mistaked for Moth. No, not Moth, Goth. <laughs> Let's get the terms right. It's a different era, Papa. It's Goth. He, he thought that, that his son got into Goth, but now he sees he's, he's starting, there's still some sparks there with Isabel, and so it's almost like Romeo and Juliet, that these two have been brought together, and you could see the last scene we had, before we cut there, you could see this, the satisfaction starting to come onto his face laying there in, in the bed in the theater, because what does any parent want for their child? Happiness. Happiness. Love, it finally, it would, oh, he's, you can see him squeaming and squirming. He's just squirming through this, oh no, no, oh, I wouldn't say that to him. Oh, you know, he's, he's having a rough time in there because of these interpretations. But now there's a nice kiss at the end of this wild scene with a march, a parade and all kinds of wild things going on in the art district. But you can see him get a little bit calmer because now he's starting to, for himself, to feel the connection and the love. Through watching these scenes, these Akashic Records scenes of his son's life. So he's making the turn. He's starting to have that love inside of him starting to come alive. You know, he's starting to feel the love himself as he's seeing these scenes. That's what stands about. That's what Jesus and the Holy Spirit are doing. Deep in our mind, in the theater, they are helping us turn it around from, from hate to forgiveness. Now he's not apathetic. He's, now he's getting sparked. <laughs> Before it was just like, it's tragic and let it end, but now he's starting to feel a love with his son. He's starting to feel a connection. He had no sense of connection whatsoever, but through these movies, you know, he's trying, he's trying to get out of the theater now. He, he, he is ready to spring into action because he wants to help. And that's the same altruistic aspect of our mind that wants to help. There was a question too that was written into me. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, I think it was Brooke Lou from Texas. And basically, um, It was a great question. Brooke wrote in from Texas. He said, my question is, if this world is my dream, are my brothers and sisters real? <laughs> That's a good question. Are my brothers and sisters real? Well, none of the bodies really are real, but remember, they're mirrors of your mind. And so their reality is spirit. And all of our realities is spirit. But, but Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to use all these dream figures, just like Stan is using these reels, to help us get in touch with what's going on in our mind. What, what do we think about them? 
What do we believe about them? You know, Brooke, Brooke was saying, are my brothers and sisters real? In the process of undoing the ego, I always get sucked into this cycle of wanting to do service for other people or applying for a job where I could be able to help more people in my understanding. And, he, and he's saying it's very confusing. So, in one sense, this is why we have to really be discerning and really listen to the guidance because in the end, it's not ultimately about healing people. It's not ultimately about healing bodies. It's not ultimately about saving the world. It's our mind that needs the help. That only our mind is where the healing is going to occur, but, but you should feel tremendously grateful for all these characters and all these scenarios and all these dreams because, why? Because sh the dreams are showing you your unconscious beliefs. And without those dream characters, so to speak, acting it all out, you wouldn't even become aware of what's going on in the dream you dream in secret, in the unconscious mind. So in one sense, you know, you can see where Stan is really using this, where he's using the theater and he's using all these reels because he's, he's bringing this up in the Kurt Douglas character's mind. Mr. Baines, he's come, it's all coming up to the surface. First of all, his apathy, his sense of, well, what can you do? I had a busy career, I couldn't be bothered. Um, he had wanted nothing to do uh, with this woman or this child, and he was very detached and quite, you might say, cold. He called himself a real bastard, he called himself. Worse than I am now, I think were the words that he used. And yet all of this, these reels in this movie theater are bringing up into his awareness all these unconscious thoughts and beliefs that he has to face, that he has to face and release before he can truly give from his heart, before the love can really pour through. So you can see it in this particular scene when he's really stirred up. Now we're starting to see some passion. And this is what uh, really Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they need some passion from our mind. We can't just blindly be going along, sleepwalking, dreaming, playing the game of the ego and not, not being sparked to answer the call to wake up. You know, we really have to, have to start to see this is our chance. This is our chance to escape from time and space through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is our chance to let the Holy Spirit and Jesus unwind us from this ego belief system and help us reach the real world with a happy dream. But we're not going to reach it unless we, we really forgive, we really release these, these illusions. So it's a perfect name for the movie, Illusion. We're getting, we're getting a real good peek into some dynamics in the mind, seeming dynamics. So let's see where it goes from here. Now we've enjoyed our time in the theater, but it's time to bring everything together. So this is where our movie today starts going a little quantum. I like it when we shift it into the quantum gear. We've been talking about the mind and the thoughts and the beliefs and and then our Mr. Baines, you know, he now he's getting passionate there in his mind. Like he wants to see his son, he wants to be helpful, he wants to share with him that that's not the voice he should listen to in his head. He wants to really get, he's activated to help. He's been having these imaginary kind of dreams where he went into the movie theater uh, when he was sleeping. Um, but now, if you'll remember at the beginning of the movie when uh, he was there in his room, there was a baseball game going on. There was a playoff game going on. And now he's watching this reel and there's a baseball game going on. And this, this, it's the playoff game that uh, they were talking about at the very beginning of the movie. So now it's kicking into quantum where 
It's like all this teaching has been going on with Stan and Vlad and the movies and the theater, and now he's getting activated to extend. And this is where what seems to be our screen of the world and our mind getting activated comes together. What does that even mean? Well, it just means you start to realize that you're not some passive dream figure just floating around like a, a loose leaf or a feather just getting blown around by the wind. Actually, that dream figure is part of your mind too. And all the dream figures are part of your mind. And that's where Jesus can activate us to Yes, allow the dream to be used for the Holy Spirit's purpose, for our only purpose. When we start to choose the purpose in our mind, remember when I was talking earlier, I was saying uh, with Laura, it's, the body is not, um, it, it doesn't have its own motivations, it doesn't have it, uh, its own feelings. Like Francis was sharing last night, the body is just a means that can be used by the Holy Spirit as a communication device. The body's not an end. The body's not the purpose of this, of, of this world, just so the body survives and then dies, and then you get another body, you do it again, you die again, you get another body, you do it again, you die again, you do it in another body, you do it again, you die again. No, no, that's not the point. The point is to listen to the Holy Spirit to get activated in your calling, activated in your purpose, so that the body, remember what you do comes from what you think. And if you start to think with the Holy Spirit, and think with Jesus, and think with your purpose of forgiveness, then the body will be used by that purpose in the plan of awakening. It will actually help you unwind from believing you're a body. But you have to allow the Spirit do it through you. So it's not you personally that's doing anything. That's like Frances was sharing before she came over uh, yesterday for the session. She wasn't doing anything. She said she was just, she was there in her apartment and she wasn't doing anything. And then she whoosh, she was over, overwhelmed by all this love. And then she came over, I saw her, she was crying. She caught in the car, she drove over, and she poured her heart out with all of you, but she didn't prepare. She didn't, she wasn't consciously like trying to do something with you. She was just in the prayer. In fact, you know, that's how it got in the whole session. It got into just this deep prayer. That's how the, the session worked its way to this deep prayer. Because she allowed the Holy Spirit to come through her to use the body, to use the lips and the mouth to speak, to look right at you in the camera, to, to smile, to gaze at you, to feel the love and the presence, and the, and the body gets used by the Spirit. Now in our movie here, basically um, Mr. Baines is just this character, he's got trouble breathing, he's choking, he's in bed, he looks like he's dying at the beginning, and he's, there's a baseball game happening, as you remember, and, and the, the guy's got the San Francisco Giants hats on, and he's ready to, to go out and run an errand, the big guy. And then when he falls asleep, he's given all this mind training. Uh, while he's sleeping and dreaming, the Spirit's working with him in, in that theater to see his son's life, to start to get activated, to start to face the things that he seems to have done in his life, to really look at his feelings and face his emotions. And now, at the end of the movie, here comes the quantum, when you start to realize that if you give yourself over to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you may get activated, you will get activated, it's not a may, you will get activated, you are getting activated <laughs> right now, because you have a function to fulfill. The spirit will use what the ego made, will use that body, will use those skills, will use those abilities. Like I was saying with Daniela, you know, great Daniela, I love that you can run 20 miles, you're fit, good. I love it. 
I can relate to that. That's, that's about twice as far as I ran. <laughs> You're really fit. That's fantastic. And you have other ambitions and you have skills and abilities. But now, as everything starts to merge and you start to get activated in your purpose, it's more like, how can I serve the whole? How can I serve the whole universe? How can I help wake myself up with the Holy Spirit's help and, and wake all my brothers and sisters up with me? We all go together. You see, there's a purpose. Jesus didn't come here for, for 33, 36 years to just dilly-dally on earth. You know, he came with a purpose. He got lit up. He was so lit up, he kept saying, my kingdom is not of this world. He was talking all about a heavenly spiritual kingdom that had nothing to do with time and space. But did he speak? Yes. Did he lay hands on people? Yes. Did the dead arise? Yes, more than once. Were the, did he send away leprosy, demons, <laughs> you know? palsy, all kinds of things. Yes, he did. He could heal the sick and raise the dead. And what does he say in the Course in Miracles? In the, he says it in the 50 Miracle Principles. He says, you can heal the sick and raise the dead because you made sickness and death and can transcend them both. You know, you can, you can you can abolish both sickness and death. You can literally, he says it in the, was it 22, 23? It's one of those early ones right in there. You can heal the sick and raise the dead. Because why? Because he's activated by the Holy Spirit. And now he's going to let that body be used by the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit use the body of Jesus? Hmm. Especially during those last three years. Wow. When he gave his mind over to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit said, let's put it into gear. Let's, let's put the pedal to the metal. Let's share the good news of the gospel. Let's heal the sick. Let's raise the dead. Let's point to the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus was, it was no longer a man speaking. It was no longer a man speaking at the end. It was, it was I am the way, the truth, and the life. Does that sound like a man to you? Uh, before Abraham was, I am. Does that sound like a man to you? That sounds like an eternal spirit speaking through a body to me. You know, he was, he was lit up in God, in God's love, and he was allowing the spirit to use that body as a communication device, like we've talked about, like Francis talked about last night. He just simply got lined up with the Holy Spirit, and that the spirit... Yes, he was dreaming the whole dream, but, but how it looked on, on earth was that there was this character going around and they were like, huh, he doesn't seem quite like us. I don't, he seems like us, but he's not like us. <laughs> he seems like us, but he's doing things that are like otherworldly. You know, like completely otherworldly. That's how powerful the mind is. That's what we were saying, Francis was saying last night. The mind is so powerful that it's literally moving the planets. It's more than moving mountains, it's moving the spheres, it's moving the galaxies, Francis said. It's that powerful. And so believe me, if you give it over, you will feel like you have dominion over the world. I remember that from the Bible. Jesus said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He said that in the Bible. Does he say that in the Course? Oh, yes, he does. My self, capital self, is ruler of the universe. Same thing. I have dominion over the world. My self is ruler of the universe. Capital self. The, my Christ self is ruler of the universe. So it's all coming together. Now with Mr. Baines, he's getting his final, final reel to watch his son. But remember, in his heart, he wants to connect. He wants, more than that, he wants to help his son see that that dark voice that's been haunting him in his mind all of his life since he was a little boy is not his voice. Is He wants to help him see the love, to feel the love, to, to help him in some way. He said that to Stan. 
And then Stan said, okay, all right, enjoy the movie. So now here it gets quantum. Here we go. We start to see the movies and the screen start to merge, the Akashic Records merging with what seems to be the screen of the world. And that's just what happens when you get activated, when you start to say, I want to be used by you, Holy Spirit, like the prayer I read earlier. Use the symbols of the world to help free me from this dream. Use them. And, and what does that mean? It means that if Jesus calls me, or the Holy Spirit calls me, I'm not going to be embarrassed. You don't have to go tell your neighbors and your partners and children, oh, I, talked, I, I had a nice uh, weekend retreat with David, and uh, Jesus is telling me I'm, I'm the light of the world, so things are going to change around here a bit. Uh, you know, sorry, uh, I've got uh, some healing to do. I'm not just going to be the doing the dishes tonight and uh, scrubbing the floor. I've actually uh, got some healing missions uh, the Holy Spirit's going to send me on. It doesn't mean you have to go tell people. It's for your own mind. It's for you. It's not to be going out and trying to build a self-concept then and, oh, Jesus told me to do this and do that, and Jesus told me, Jesus told me. You're going to get some funny looks if you put Jesus told me in front of everything that you say. But I'm actually saying he's actually in there. He's really there, and he's really reaching you in your mind, and he really wants you to follow the guidances and follow the instructions not for him to escape anything, because he's already escaped. This is, this is your instructions, like that old TV show, Mission Impossible. This is Mission Impossible. Your, your task, should you decide to accept the purpose is your only choice, your task is to awaken from this dream. And he's like, Morpheus, I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. You need to get into the mode of listening and following this high intuitive guidance because that, in the end, is going to make all the difference. We'll, I know Francis, I, all of us, will talk, Jeffrey, Greg, all of us are going to talk about guidance. We're just, we're only, what are we, not even a little bit over halfway through. We still got time left. We're going to get into the guidance, but right now, you're going to see that with Mr. Baines, he actually is getting activated, and this is where he's going to, it's going to merge. The screen and the dream visions are, are going to merge together. Here's our purpose is the only choice moment. It's all quantum. You know, you, you hold on to the death's wish, you perceive death. <laughs> And you forgive, and you listen, and you follow, and you act upon that guidance, and you get joy, and you get happiness, and you get joining. It's the same, you're just watching the movie, it's all quantum. So it's not like there's different parallel lives going on, it's all happening simultaneously, and it's all simultaneously a reflection of your mind, and more important than that, even it's the reflection of your purpose that you're holding in mind. So for our, our lead character there, Donald Baines, you know, he, are you just going to let it end? It's a tragedy. Are you going to let it end? Are you going to let it end? Finally, no. No, I will not just let this death wish go on and on and on. It's time for me to open up to my purpose, to decide for it, to go for the choice of purpose, so that why? So I can see a different world, so that I can be taken into the happy dream through my change of mind. Not by trying to change people, not by trying to change governments, not by trying to change the environment, not by trying to change your body, but by changing your mind, the purpose in your mind, to say yes to spirit and to say no to the ego. And I mean a firm no, like Donald Baines. You know, he was asked again, you're going to let it, it's tragedy, you're going to let it end, you're going to let it end. He finally, he finally came to his spirit life and he just was like, no. 
And then he was activated to take action, to follow. He wrote down on the back of uh, the, the picture of his son when he was young. He wrote down a message and he told this guy, you know, go, you've got to go from Hollywood where the films are made. You've got to go up to San Francisco. You've got to go right to this place. He told him right where to go from the, from the visions and everything. And this is exactly what it's all about. You've got to accept your purpose as a decision in mind. You have to really, fully, really go for it. You can't be wishy-washy with this. It's like, uh, well, I've tolerated the ego for so long. Maybe I'll just tolerate it a little longer. Maybe it'll get better. No, it's not going to get better. If you, if you have a death wish in your mind, you're going to keep perceiving the witnesses to the death wish until you choose a different purpose. So that's why we, this whole weekend is dedicated. All these calls for love, all these cries for love that come up truly are, are for the Spirit, and it's truly the chance to, to say yes. So let's see how it plays out. We saw how the other scenario played out when he just let it end. It was a crumpled body of his, his uh, son stabbed in the alleyway, and now he is given a chance to shift the purpose of the dream. Not that actually the dream will, the dream actually doesn't shift like this, but the way that you perceive it, this is, this is just symbolic of you will see the world differently when you hold a different purpose in your mind. See how it goes here. Well, that was a good one. <laughs> That's on theme for us. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Really showing how we have to, we have, we have to come back in our purpose. And as I was just, we were ending the movie there, I, I wanted to, uh, yeah, Muna, you were, you had that uh, experience. I really didn't get around to your uh, question there, but because I was so uh, so exhilarated by that uh, experience that you shared that you had um, a few years ago. I'll read it again, because it's very applicable to this uh, movie and to our theme of the day. A few years ago, I woke up presumably a few seconds before I was supposed to, and I saw in my mind that the fourth generator the ego turns on every morning to make me believe I am in the world was not turned on yet. An ego slip-up. And so, I saw clearly what the ego does to convince me I am in the world. I can also see the world as a massive screen hiding something behind it. So I pray to God for the veil to lift so I can connect with reality constantly. That's the rest of the story. That's the rest. It's like a prayer. It's like a miracle, and then that's how the prayer, the prayer for all of us in the retreat, that's how it, how it ended. And so, what precedes it is you're just pouring your heart out of saying that, that there seems to be no constancy in my heart for more than a few seconds. The prayer ends with, so I pray to God for the veil to lift so I can connect with reality constantly. And then it starts off with this, that's where the pouring your heart out, that's where the transparency comes in. You know, it's like Frances is sitting here right next to me and I don't, some of you have not seen her movie yet, you know, Take Me Home. But she received a, a dream uh, six years was it six years before the movie? Before the, making. before the making of the movie, she received in a dream that she would make a movie. And so she was kind of on alert 
Uh, but basically, every time she got concerned about this dream and how it would happen and when and where and with whom and everything, Jesus would say, it's already done. Like, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. It's already, like the movies of the world, they're already done. The illusions have ended. There, there is an end. And the Holy Spirit corrected the whole belief in separation, the instant, simultaneously, when it seemed to happen. And so now, even though it took less than a second to heal the belief in separation, the acceptance of that correction can seem to take millions of years, actually. The, the resistance to accepting that correction. So, in instead of trying to work it out, because sometimes your mind gets very, tries to be precise and mathematical, almost like you're trying, to, you're in a chess game with the ego, and you're moving your pieces and trying to make the right moves so, so you don't get checkmate against you from the death wish. You know, you don't want to make a slip up uh, playing that chess game. It puts a lot of pressure on the whole, the whole situation. People can feel pressurized, you know, like terrified of the awakening, but actually knowing deep in their heart that that's what, what their purpose is. Uh, and yet it's, it can be absolutely terrifying because of the years of that voice in your mind, because of those dark, dark memories, those dark experiences, those intense experiences that are like seemingly burned into the mind in an indelible way. It's very dark, it's very thick. And yet, it's the same answer for all of us. The, the Holy Spirit will meet you where you believe you are. It doesn't matter where you believe you are in time and space. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit meets the mind where it believes it is. And as Francis was talking last night, that power of that mind, that power of those thoughts, and, and also belief is what you brought up, that what you believe is kind of like Pygmalion, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whatever you believe with this powerful mind, you draw forth as a witness. As you sow, so shall you reap. You know, giving and receiving are the same. The world that seems to be outside is just a reflection of actually what is within, and that's why it takes such a focus to go within. And practically speaking, where do they meet? How do we really make contact with the Holy Spirit? How do we really step into the healing? How do we really move inward into the mind, to a place of devotion, to, to let everything be used just for healing, for one purpose? The only purpose of anything is, is for healing, is for the mind waking up. That's the only purpose that the Holy Spirit has for the world. The Holy Spirit has no other purpose other than the healing in the mind, other than the waking up. So, ultimately, that's when we say purpose is the only choice, that is your inroad to guidance. Because if, if your mind is, is addicted to form, or if you feel so caught up in the roles, and the, the illusion seems to be very thick in your mind, you seem to be in some kind of a hypnotic, Mesmer, mesmerized state where you are wondering and confused with what am I going to do and with my life. Many of these questions are here's what's going on for me in my experience. Can you help me? Can the Spirit help me? Can the Spirit reach me in this state of mind that I seem to find myself? which is perplexing and frustrating and confusing and it feels very schizophrenic at times, it feels psychotic at times. Can you reach me? And that is through the guidance. That's like in the movie when he becomes activated and he says no to the ego through this burst of love, 
through this miracle, then it's a washing away of this old voice, of these old thoughts and these old ideas. So to me, that's what this movie was about, and that's what this session this morning is about, is like, is like we're here to regain an awareness of the power of the mind. We're here to regain the, 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 this is sense that we have a choice of purpose. And we're here to remember that we're going to have to be vigilant and devoted into putting our attention towards this purpose. I practiced, I know when I first got the course and I started reading the course, I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm starting to get the gist of this, Jesus. Like, I, I had that prayer at the beginning of the book, back in the days when there was just one version of A Course in Miracles, it was on page 24. Uh, I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. You, some of you know that prayer. I think it's on page 28 from the, from the later editions. But basically, I said, okay, that's a beautiful prayer. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. So I had to actually pray that prayer over and over in my mind throughout the day, and I tried to associate it with something in form. So every time I would go through a doorway, when I was going to the grocery store, to visit my grandmother, uh, to to the gas station, going into the restroom, going wherever I seemed to be going. It didn't matter. Whenever I would come to a threshold of, of a door, I would use that as my cue to pray the prayer. Because I didn't want it to be ritualistic, but I wanted it to be something that I kept bringing my attention back to. When I'm going shopping, I'm not really going shopping for the groceries. I'm there to be truly helpful and to let Jesus teach me in that grocery store how to connect and join with my brothers and sisters, how to be truly helpful. When I'm at the gas station, same thing. When I'm going to a course meeting, when I'm going to a church, when I'm going to visit my, my a relative, a friend, my mother, my father, I had to start really applying that prayer in my mind to what was in front of me in the dream world so that I could start to convert my mind over to this new purpose out of David and the blinders, you know, me, myself and I, you know, you remember the story Renee Zellweger and, uh, and me, myself and Irene yeah, that was a pretty wild movie with Jim Carrey and playing a couple parts but it was me, myself, and Irene, it was, he had his kind of alter ego in that one, Jim Carrey, great performance. But, but we need to get out of these, being so identified with this personality self, and being so identified with, with just trying to do everything from a personal motive, what will support me, or just support me and my family, so tiny. That is so tiny. If you're just making decisions for your personality self and your family, what about the rest of the seven billion? Did you ever consider that? <laughs> Maybe you, your mind has a, a calling that will bless all seven billion with your miracles. It will, it will reach out and spread all across the whole world, across the universe, across the universes of universes. Your mind is that powerful, and, and that means that instead of basing your future life on the past and your past preferences, what you wanted, your past ambitions, future goals, you know, that was one of the things that, that Francis addressed when you started talking about goals. I remember one of the questions was about, what about my goals? Can, can I have goals for things in this world and 
can I have purpose? Well, as long as you believe in those goals of the world, I'll tell you right now, they're coming from the self-concept. Those are generated by the ego. All goals of the future are generated by the ego. And, and I think somewhere we, all, we, we already know that intuitively. Holly, you're down there in Brisbane, you, you know that going for that PhD is not necessarily your entry point into eternity. <laughs> But, it's, you're putting a pretty good energy into that, into that PhD. But that's a future goal, that's just an example. And we could go through all of these, you know, there's, everybody has future goals, everybody has ambitions. That's what it means to be part of the human condition. However, it's how willing am I to say, I am ready to be activated and I know Jesus you will use all my education, all my learning, all my skills and abilities, even though they were developed under the ego's framework, that's, they were made by the ego, if I give them over, if I say, they're yours, Jesus, you pull the puppet strings, you use the skills. Like Marina's here, she's been using her bilingual Spanish-English skills, and she's take a, she took a plane ride from Argentina and she came to Mexico and then all the brothers and sisters in Mexico went, yay, Marina's here, we can't speak Spanish, <laughs> we, we need somebody who can help translate our words and to help us hear Spanish words translated into English, you know. There's a great rejoicing that went up all around in Lake Chapala. <laughs> And we've been rejoicing ever since, too. We, the party hasn't even stopped. I guess there's no way to move the camera over on you, but there she's just sitting right over here. You just have my mug on the screen, but she, there, you can wave to her. She's right, oh, here we go. So, switch. <laughs> That's Marina. That's Marina. She was on one of these online retreats and, and then she poured her heart out and went through a big healing process with Jason and then I was sitting in the room going, we need her in Mexico. <laughs> and then here she is in Mexico, letting her bilingual skills be used for the plan of awakening. She's, she's now under Christ's control and that's a good thing. I know you may send a shudder a fear down some of you, but actually it's a good thing <laughs> to put those two words together, Christ control. It just means you're under guidance, you're under alignment, you're, you're being used in the plan in a very helpful way that sends a blessing across the whole universe. So this is what I mean by guidance. Grace, you're there. I mean, you've been working to be a doctor. That's when you first called me. I was, I was sitting in a room down here in Mexico and I'm sitting there and then my phone starts ringing and uh, I, I had it on silent actually, to all honesty, I keep my phone on silent. So, but I'm sitting there and all of a sudden my eyes turned to my phone and I see someone's, someone's calling me on the phone and, and, it's, and then it, so I called Grace back and we, she's like, oh, I'm, I'm an intern, I mean, I'm, I'm in medical school and things are not working and I'm, I'm trying to pass all these standards and these marks and for some strange reason I keep failing one aspect of the thing that I should be passing and it's starting to get to me. I'm starting to wonder, something fishy is going on. I, everybody's telling me, you're smart, you're brilliant, you should be able to pass that with the breeze and yet you, try, you can't, you, pa you fail it, you fail it, you know. And then you call me and I'm going, yeah, we talked for about an hour and a half. I'm like, well, yeah, this is Jesus calling. Uh, this is Jesus behind this. Uh, you can't judge your advances from your retreats. Maybe you're failing that part of, of your whole career in med school just so there can be a crack of opening for the purpose that will connect you to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, which is what you've been praying for all along anyway. And yet the ego is going, oh, this is, oh, this is going to ruin 
Jesus is going to ruin your, your career, is going to ruin your life. Being an autonomous, powerful woman, he's going to turn you into the Christ if you keep going in that direction. And, and the ego's like, that is not good. Not good at all. That's the worst scenario <laughs> the ego can conceive of. So, and I know a lot of you, I see you, Grace, on there, I see when, I, when they light up the screen, we're all on this journey together. Dennis, I see you there. You know, we're, we're being called. We're being called out of the world. We're being called to be the light of the world. And we have to just tune in. That's where our confusion goes away. That's where our, those, those mixed emotions that we have, that can be very confusing, the only way out of it is, is through the answer, is, is through tuning in. Like Donald Baines, we have, to, we have to give a firm no to the ego and a firm yes you know, to the spirit. Well, I'm looking at the clock. I always, I'm always out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Figuratively, literally. <laughs> but I'm coming to you from out of time, and I'm calling you into the timeless. And I'm calling you to accept yourself as the light of the world, because you are, and I am, and we are the light of the world. And, and when we experience darkness, it's because we have not brought forth the light that we were called forth to bring. In any situation that we judge as dark, it's simply we have not extended what we were called to, to extend. That was the whole purpose of us using a body, is to extend the miracle and let the miracle come through us. And really the body doesn't have any other purpose except to be used as a miracle worker. If you really want it straight, I'm just giving you the straight truth, the body's only purpose is to be a miracle worker. And everything else, as you get into that more and more, everything will fade away, it fades farther away, it fades farther away. You know, I, I'm, I'm going through this transformation like all of you. I mean, my, my appetites are leaving, you know, it's like I, I I rem I'm reminded of that time when Neo goes into the Matrix and he, he says, oh, those are the good noodles over there. But it's like a faint memory. And, and uh, he's trying to recall how good those noodles were in that shop. And then Trinity is saying to him, you know, the Matrix cannot tell you who you are. And the world of images can never tell us who we are. But the spirit within us absolutely can tell us who we are. Because we are spirit, we are not flesh creatures. It just, we seem to be surrounded by the body, so we have to give it over to a, a higher purpose in order to unwind ourselves from this uh, addiction to personalities and, and, and people. I mean, there's even one part of the Course where Jesus says, the ego peopled the world peopled the world? That's a verb. Jesus is using peopled as a verb. How's that for a sentence? The ego peopled the world. That's an interesting description of projection. And we thought it was all about Adam and Eve and who begat who and begat, 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 begat. I used to believe all that linear garbage when I grew up and I read all my begats in the Old Testament and I'm like, okay, and Isaac, and it's hard to keep track of. can't keep track of that stuff now. There's one Christ. There's, thankfully, there's only one of us. And, and we're not a linear procreation projection. You know, that's all false cause and effect. Sexuality, false cause and effect. Genetics, false cause and effect. DNA, false cause and effect. Disease, hereditary disease, false cause and effect. I'm telling you, the deeper you get into this, you're going to see that the holy instant is much more attractive than trying to play around with all these false cause effect associations of the ego, because they, they make no sense. So thank you for hanging in there with me in the movie, and we're going to have a panel discussion 
tomorrow between a collaboration between Camus and uh, Camus, Utah, and Mexico. So we're all going to be here. And I think also it'll be a great chance to ask any kind of questions, but, but also we're all happy to witness some of the steps that we seem to go through or what was going on in our mind as we opened up to answer the call. Because I know that it's very important for you that we're very practical, so you need. Lot, I needed lots of examples. I was a slow learner. Jesus had to really convince me. Okay, give me a, give me another example. Okay, hit me again. Okay, hit me again. Hit me hit me again. Remind me again. What was that? Hit me again. You know, it's like, you know. Okay, shake me up a little bit. Yeah, that's good. I I want to become clear. So, shake up the ego. That's fine if the ego gets shaken. I'm, I'm willing to go through that as long as I can come through into the light. That's, that's why we have the, the faith. So thank you all so much. And I love you. And I'm, I'm just so grateful we got to spend these hours together today because, you know, we have, to, we have to cheer each other up on this. Uh, we can't succumb to the ego. We can't just let the story end in death. Um, we actually are here to resurrect our mind and uh, become under Christ's control. And, and I know you can all do it because you're just reflections of me and I'm doing it. So I, 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 to I totally believe, I have confidence in that. So. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>